Hello and welcome to this episode of NewsClick's Mapping Fault Lines. In this show, we look at key geopolitical developments and their impact across the world. Today, we'll be talking about the impeachment of Donald Trump, the proceedings that are happening right now, and its implications on the politics of the region where Russia and Ukraine are located. To talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Purkais. Hello, Prabir. Prabir, so this week is a key week for the impeachment proceedings. The US House Judiciary Committee is going to draw, see to draw up the articles of impeachment. First of all, they're going to see if there is a case for impeachment in the first place. And we'll get to that a bit later. But before that, a lot of the narrative that was going on during the impeachment proceedings, the, wit the hearing of the witnesses, was about how the so-called quid pro quo efforts of Trump ended up weakening a crucial ally that was Ukraine, which was a bulwark of, uh, say, force against Russian aggression. And th that was the whole narrative that was being peddled. So could we talk a bit about what exactly is the kind of uh, so-called uh, bulwark that Ukraine is and what is the situation there? You know, first is we don't really understand the United States politics sitting from outside because we seem to have originally seen the Republicans as a party of war and the only people, therefore, who could do peace were the Republicans because anything the Democrats do would then be really uh, targeted as right. surrender to the Russians, to the Chinese, to the Reds, and so on. From that, we now seem to see Democrats as a party of war, which is now saying there should be no peace with Russia, and everything should be in the scene from the prism of Russia, subverting our key allies, and Ukraine is being now talked about. Now, interestingly enough, Ukraine is not officially an American ally. In fact, Ukraine was positioned in between the two blocks for quite some time, and Yanukovych was trying to play one against the other and preserve a certain degree of uh, mobility or flexibility of the Ukrainian uh, government. Partly because Ukraine is next door to Russia, there is a huge section of its population who speaks Russian or are ethnically Russians. A lot of its economy is tied up to Russia. It has to sell to, or used to sell to Russia. And therefore, its natural trading partner was Russia. Right. As against this, trying to tie up to the West has the problems that A, it would mean that what Ukraine would supply would therefore be only raw materials or its people. And that was not going to give Ukraine as good a terms of integration or uh, trade as the trade with Russia was. Therefore, Yanukovych was trying to play both sides. But all of it collapsed because, as you know, the Maidan revolt, which was backed by uh, various forces, including obviously NATO, and you had U.S., senior government officials of the United States going in and even talking to the Maidan people, at the end of which Yanukovych ran away, essentially, and Poroshenko came into power. Now, what is forgotten is there is a larger picture here of NATO, which, when the negotiations had take, taken place over Germany, was supposed to stop at the German borders. This was the uh, assurance given to Gorbachev during that time that if you let Germany reunify, then we, the NATO's eastward march, would not take place. It stopped Germany. Not only did it stop, but it advanced in the Baltics, it advanced in Poland, it advanced with Romania, and now the next one was Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now it is really ringing in whole of Russia. If it's a, with NATO countries and also mounting various uh, missile uh, brigades over there which can hit Russia, including uh, strategic missiles. Right. All of this is called anti-ballistic missiles, but as you know, the difference between ballistic missiles and anti-ballistic missiles is not that significant. It can be turned one to the other quite easily. So all of this is what Russia was reacting to, and this is in, in a longer sense term, is a huge issue for Europe because it means Russia should be ringed in. The battle over 
dominance of Europe will be waged between really the United States via its proxies and Western Europe essentially would not be able to integrate in the Eurasian landmass, which is really Russia and China, the right. big markets and lower down with India, but they would be tied up to the United States. This is the larger geostrategic picture mm -hmm. when we talk about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and it's also interesting to see actually whenever a Ukraine ceasefire has been uh, announced or has been negotiated, it has been with the European countries and Russia along with the Ukrainian forces and unfortunately most of those agreements have remained uh, dead on water because the United States didn't back them at all. In fact, it backed the other side. Okay. Zelensky came into power with the argument that we will seek peace mm. because one part of uh, Ukraine, which is also ethnically Russian, has decided that it doesn't want to be part of what the Maidan regime brought out, which was old-fashioned Nazis oh. and they had been a part of Hitler's uh, armies, they had been a part of the pogroms over there against the Jews and they essentially were the ones and there are again forces which have been openly talked about as fascist forces by European uh, countries and by even the United States. So those are the forces who had dominated the Ukrainian government and wanted a fight with first the eastern part of Ukraine, which was fighting to keep its autonomy and wanted to secede virtually, which the Russians have backed politically, but not for secession. Right. So they want a more autonomous eastern Ukraine and not an eastern Europe, which becomes tries to become a part of Russia. So that Russians have never supported. But effectively what has happened is, any attempt to reach peace has been sabotaged. Zelensky again came on the platform that he wanted to settle the issue with Eastern uh, Ukraine and also reach some agreement with Russia and try for a peace with Ukraine. This seems to be anathema to the section of the Democratic Party who have talked about Trump and Ukraine's uh, tie-up and the fact that Trump tried to pressurize Zelensky to investigate Biden. Now we've discussed this earlier. The question is, Trump seems to have acted crudely. Presidents of the United States, of course, do all, all of these things, but do they do it that openly? Do they pick up a phone and call the president of another country, do this or do that? Those questions will leave to the US uh, Senate and the US uh, Congress. Mm -hmm. The point that I'm making is, the issue if you take Ukraine, and Russia, then obviously this is a much more a matter of Europe. Mm. And this the fact that we are seeing the Democratic Party claim that Trump is some way or the other a stooge of Putin, a stooge of A, a stooge of B, and is trying to do various things, actually exposes that the, this, this country today, the United States, cannot be cannot really sign any agreement because if one side signs agreement, other side pulls, pulls out. We saw Paris Trump agreement. pulling out pulling out of the Iran agreement. Right. And now we see Ukraine, whatever they do, whichever part come, party comes into power, if they want to force to settle Ukraine, then they will get Iran. If they settle Iran, then they will get Ukraine. Right. This seems to be the kind of po policies each party is playing with the other. And the net result is we really have a situation where no peace is possible right. anywhere in the world because the United States domestic squabbles mm -hmm. will see to it whether it's Iran or it's Ukraine, a peace doesn't take place. Right. And what we're also seeing is that the Democratic Party in its, uh, as part of its campaign to discredit and definitely, if possible, try to impeach Trump is actually legitimizing the understanding that the US by default is a country which has the right to interfere anywhere in the world. Because among other things, Joe Biden openly went on record to say how boast how he had helped overthrow that government. And so uh, this is a one aspect that's never really being questioned in these hearings at all, because even those career diplomats who testified during the hearings and spoke out against Trump were widely celebrated. But the underlying, uh, underlying aspect that they all supported we are supposed to be the global policeman has not been questioned at all. You know, that's the interesting part because all of them are talking about that opening a investigations mm -hmm. against what Biden and his son were doing in Ukraine is somehow a treasonous right. 
exactly. affair. But openly subverting Ukraine's democracy, Ukraine's limited, shall we say, democratic elections. That's entirely legitimate. Exactly. Right? And this is also part of what the US has done. If you remember, there was a Time magazine year, year cover which celebrated that the United States won the election for Yeltsin. Hmm. Okay. Nobody contests that. Nobody says, well, you know, that wasn't supposed to be done. The United States has openly, in, militarily invaded, I think, in the last 50 years, more than 90 countries. Nobody questions that in the United States till the body bags come home, which it did in Vietnam. Otherwise, it's perfectly okay. As long as it is drones, it is other instruments of war, not directly people, the United right. States losing its soldiers. So this is one part of it. But, you know, if you take the question of Ukraine itself, there is also enough grounds to show that the Democrats have been involved with Ukraine or Ukrainians in the U.S. elections, in 2016 elections, if you argue that Trump was being helped by the Russians, again, as we have said earlier also, the click farm, which were trying to get clicks, were trying to get clicks on both sides. The fact they got more clicks from Trump's, it's simply the fact that Trump's supporters are probably more active in such, such clickbait operations, right. and they're more prey to fake news than other parties are. But if you leave that out, there were clear Ukrainian fingerprints against Trump because they thought that the Trump could mean some reapprochement with Russia and this was not in the interest of the Poroshenko regime at that time. And they were trying to help, it's argued. There is Chapul Chalupa who was a part of the Democratic uh, National Committee's effort. She was a contractor there. There's an argument that CrowdStrike is an uh, ethnic Ukrainian who runs that company, though a U.S. citizen, and somehow the crowd strike fingered the Russians without much evidence. And even today, they're, they're those uh, servers of the Democratic National Committee has never been uh, forensically examined by the U.S. Uh, intelligence agencies, though they have given reports regarding the, that, but uh, based purely appears on the crowd strike report. So all of this would seem to indicate that intervention in U.S. elections is all uh, all right, as long as it happens to see that the Russians are the main enemy. Mm -hmm. If there is any attempt to have a reapprochement, even which is the interest of the United States itself, that should be abjured. And this is really a part of what I would say is the continuance dominance of the war lobby in the United States and what somebody has called the never-ending wars, right. which the U.S. today sees it as its pre primary economic uh, activity. Mm -hmm. War industry of different kinds is what really drives the U.S. economy, and therefore they can never let go of the, of the wars. And I think one of the uh, articles that I saw recently, uh, written by an ex-army officer, is that as the wars become against smaller and smaller countries that the U.S. wages, the number of medals the generals wear on their chest right. seems to be growing. Right. Now apparently the generals have seven rows of medals on their chest, while in the after the second war, the world war they had only three. So you can see that there is a war industry and there is a war veteran industry, mm -hmm. which is decided by how many medals you get, right. and that is what you wear. To the TV stations and that determines also the amount of money you get as a consultant and as a media commentator. Right. And finally to look at uh, the impact of all this inside the United States itself. Like you mentioned this is an extremely complicated process and the Democrats themselves seem to be in a bit of a fix. There is one side arguing against doing any of these proceedings. There's one side calling for a censure motion which would basically end the impeachment process there. And there's definitely a hardline side which wants to go ahead with the impeachment process nonetheless. So do you think that if there is this process does go ahead, there is any possibility of Trump actually being affected by any of these proceedings or is he actually likely to benefit? You know, one thing is the crystal ball gazing for predicting elections. It's a very, very risky exercise. Right. 
if I look at the crystal ball, I have not been a very successful one. It came to Indian elections. So why should I be better off on the American, the United States elections? I would say the core base of Trump does not seem to be affected by mm -hmm. this, by all the figures that we see of the uh, polls that are taken right now regarding which section approves or doesn't approve of Trump. Interestingly enough, Trump's base does not seem to have shifted. Right. So the elections then boil down to what is called also the electoral college. And that does not correlate with population mm -hmm. because, you know, Hillary won 3 million more votes than Trump did, except Trump won the electoral college. Right. So as long as you have the electoral college skewed, skewed towards those states which have less people, but comparatively more representation in the Electoral College, I think Trump seems to be safe. Mm -hmm. There are three or four uh, states, swing states, which are called the swing states, mm -hmm. but that would depend on who the Democrats put up. Right. If they put up somebody like Biden, somebody like uh, now the guy who has thrown his hat in the ring, the former mayor Michael of Bloomberg. B Bloomberg, the five, former mayor of uh, New, New York, York and a billionaire, He's going to throw his billions into the ring. Of course, Trump is a failed billionaire because his real estate business actually always made losses. And he's the most, the richest bankrupt uh, American ever, uh, probably. But if you take Blim Bloomberg or Biden, I don't think Trump would really face a problem. If it came against somebody who also can turn against him the base which is affected by all that's happening in the United States, like Bernie Sanders, then I think you could have a different kind of election. But I look looking at the fact that Democratic National Committee is in really in hawk to the Clinton, Clinton uh, uh, machinery. I don't think there is any chance of their being able to get the nomination. So you you are looking at a weak opposition finally to Trump, mm -hmm. and I don't think that with the Senate majority that. Trump has, there is any chance of an impeachment finally going going through. So what you are seeing is a shift from the real policies that today bedevil the United States, how to shore up its uh, flagging infrastructure. It's really, uh, if you see, go to the United States, you will see that the air, for instance, the airports, the roads, all of this really look relatively third world, shall we say that compared to what you see in China, for example. So I think this is the crisis that the US, uh, all the political parties want not to face. Right. And the result, therefore, is talking about how to make America great again and how to fight a few more wars. Trump is not withdrawn from our war. He has sent more soldiers to Syria. He wants a war with Iran. He has done shadow boxing with North Korea, but almost brought it to war at one point. So it's not that there has been any change in Trump's war policies, except that he wants to fight a different set of countries than what the Democrats want to right. fight. So I think both sides really are looking at policies which distract attention of the people from the real issues. And as long as that continues, if a Biden wins, a Trump wins, or a Bloomberg wins. Right. I don't think it's going to make a difference to the rest of the world. Right. We are still going to see the United States wage war against the, the people of the world and against the planet itself. If we look at climate change to other things that are happening. Right. Thank you, Prabhupada. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.